All right, well, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter number two, if we could. Hebrews, chapter number two. President Woodrow Wilson once received a call in the middle of the night from a civil servant who informed him that one of his appointees had just died. The caller said, well, I'm sure we are all saddened by this news. I would like to know if I could take his place. Well, there was a pause at the other end of the line before the president replied, well, it's all right with me if it's all right with the undertaker. <laughs> Think about that just for a little bit, all right? As comical as that sounds, the subject of death is probably the most sub sobering subject to discuss, isn't it? Tonight, as we continue our series, Eternal Things, we're going to consider this subject matter in greater detail because it is this event, the passing through death's door, we enter into eternity. The time when the reality of the invisible world will become vividly visible to us. What does the Bible say about this portal into the afterlife? Quite a bit, actually. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 2 tonight, verse 14 will be our text. This says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, speaking of Christ, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Tonight I'd like to spend some time looking at, if I can get my PowerPoint going here, there we go. Spend some time looking at what I call the door to eternity. The door to eternity. Let's have a word of prayer first. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this opportunity to look in this subject. Though it's not an easy one to address, it is certainly something we need to be informed and educated on from the Bible's perspective. This portal that we go through, this door that crosses us from this life into the next. Father, help us gain some understanding on this subject that you may be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. I think most of us here have heard of Benjamin Franklin. He was one of the most well-known of America's founding fathers, but he was never short on giving sarcastic yet wise quips about life. He wrote one time uh, about the, the newly signed Constitution and in the midst of his, of his writings, he made this statement, In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. <laughs> death and taxes. You know, if life has one guarantee, it is that we are all going to die one day. That's a guarantee. There are lots of businesses that give you lifetime guarantees on their products or a certain length of time of, uh, of uh, a guarantee. But really, there's only one true guarantee out there, is that one day we will pass through this portal, this door, into eternity. Here in Hebrews, go to Hebrews chapter number 9. This is probably the most uh, well-known verse in regards to what I'm speaking of here. But it says here in verse 27, And it is appointed unto men once to die. Once to die. But after this, the judgment. We'll get into that portion in another message. But the point tonight is, this is our guarantee. We will all pass through that door to eternity unless we happen to be the fortunate people who are alive when the rapture takes place. And that's kind of what I'm hoping for. I like to go up first before going down first, if you know what I mean. I would love to be part of that. What a special event that would be uh, to, to have a part in the calling up of the saints uh, with that trumpet sound. But I may not. And many, many, many people, millions in fact, over the centuries have hoped to be part of that group, but of course we're not. The reality of death, though, is expressed multitude, multitude of times throughout the scriptures, isn't it? In fact, the word death appears 342 times in the Bible. The word die appears another 299 times. 
The word grave in reference, in, in reference to death is 65 times. The word dieth uh, 26 times. And the word dead 331 times. You never knew that it talked about death so much, did you? Yeah, needless to say, it's a significant subject with major implications on our lives. Now, death originated with the introduction of sin into the world. The Bible makes that statement very clear in Romans 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and what? Death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for, all, for that all have sinned. Death originated with the introduction of sin into this world and has passed on to every human being since then because we are all sinful creatures. If you know the story, God warned Adam about disobeying him in regards to the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we revisit this story a little bit. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt, what? Surely die. Death would be introduced into the creation. Now, if you follow the story in Genesis chapter 3, we know Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they did not die physically that day, did they? In fact, Adam would go on and live 900 and some years before his actual physical death. We don't know about Eve, but we know Adam lived quite a long time beyond that. But what happened the day that they ate of that fruit is that they died spiritually. In other words, they became separated from God as a result of what they did. Because the word death actually means separation. There's a separation that takes place. And when you think of death, uh, what happens, at least what we're most familiar with, physical death, you have the soul that separates from the body. And... Uh, and and there's, there's that example. When Adam and Eve sinned, a, a process of death really began. A process that started with spiritual death. Eventually it would lead to physical death. And ultimately it would lead to eternal death, if you will. The Bible says that we are naturally, as a result of their sin, born dead spiritually. Uh, Paul mentions this to the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, or means being brought back to life, having forgiven you all, all trespasses. I can't get into the whole depth of what this verse is talking about, but he, he's writing to the Colossian Christians, and he said, you were dead initially. You were dead in your sins. You were dead spiritually. You were separated from God. Well, if, over the course of time, of course, they would eventually die physically, as it is appointed unto men, once to die, speaking of the physical death, because of our sinfulness. And if our sins are not atoned for and dealt with in this life, before we die, we'll ultimately die eternally. Separated for God forever. The Bible mentions in Romans 6.23 a very familiar verse, for the wages of sin is death. It's speaking of that final eternal death, if you will. Now the Bible refers to that eternal death as the second death. If you go to Revelation chapter number 20, Revelation chapter 20, we see it mentioned in verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So notice the second death is mentioned here, but you have to continue on to get a fuller understanding of what that all means. Verse 13, it says, this is, uh, this is on the day of judgment, when God judges those who are unsaved. And the sea gave up the dead, the spiritually dead, which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the... Notice the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Look at verse 8 of chapter 21. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Say, so why is this referring to the second death? Well, when people die physically lost, they go to what we refer to oftentimes as hell. Okay? It's a holding place, really. It's a torturous place. It's a place of torment. But as you see here on the day of judgment, we'll get into this more when we cover this subject matter, 
they are actually brought out of that holding place. And, they are, they're, and that's why they stand before God. And then they are rightly judged accordingly. They, they have their time in court. It's like, it's like when, when somebody is put in prison here before their trial, they're in prison for a certain amount of time. In this case, there is no bail. <laughs> no bail bonds to be sold here. And, and they await trial. They're brought back out. They're found guilty. And then they are cast into <laughs> God's form of federal eternal prison, which is the lake of fire. The, lake of the, the, the casting into the lake of fire is the second death, where ultimately there will be the eternal death. In other words, the eternal separation from God forever. That's the synopsis of what, what this process of death, that's what it's going to culminate to. Now, nobody in their right mind wants to participate in the second death, though Jesus Christ himself said, actually, most will, sadly. Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and the broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, the second death. And many there be which go in thereat. Many. Now many is more than a few, right? <laughs> I don't know what the percentage is, but many is still more than, than a few. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. In comparison to those that are going to heaven, there's only a few in comparison to the many that will be going in the opposite direction. Because the only escape from the second death is salvation. In other words, accepting Jesus Christ as your sin bearer, being saved or born again as the Bible put it, puts it. Having a time in your life where you recognize that that uh, your sin is sending you out into this second death destiny. But with a heart of contrition, you're willing to uh, acknowledge the terribleness of your sin and repent of it, willing to go in a new direction in life while you trust Jesus Christ alone to blot out that sin account instead of yourself anymore. You do that by faith. And if you're from your heart of your heart are willing to accept those terms... All you have to do is ask him to save you, and he will. And he'll pull you off that road to the, from, uh, that would lead you to the second death, the lake of fire, and he'll put you on the road to heaven. Th those are the terms of getting out of that predicament because we're all naturally born on that road. That's why it's so significant that one prepares for the moment he or she passes through death's door into eternity so that they know that they're in the right spot when they get there. For we are on that side of death's door much longer than we are on this side. Far longer. <laughs> Today, let's consider some thoughts in light of our subject. Let's consider first off what I call the fear. The fear. Now, our text back in... Hebrews chapter 2 addresses the reason death is such a sobering subject. It's a very heavy subject, isn't it? You know, maybe tonight you came and you're hoping to be edified, and maybe more tonight is a little bit more on the education side. But this is something, this subject is so important because we just kind of dismiss it from our minds because it is heavy and it is hard. But it's a reality that if not faced will lead to something more horrific than anybody can ever begin to explain or imagine. And, and our, our text addresses the reason, the reason why death is such a sobering subject. It's the fear that's associated with it. it. mentions in verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death. In fact, it's such a debilitating fear that it robs people of life while they live. You realize that? It robs people why? because they're scared to death of doing certain things. Well, if I do that, I could die. I could, if I do this, I could die. And this robs God's people of even going out by faith trying to do things because, well, you know, if I went to a mission field, I might die. Or if, I, if, I, if I went across the street, I might die. Well, maybe not, I don't know. I don't know your neighbor, I guess. <laughs> but, you, but you know, I'm not saying putting ourselves in, 
in, in a place of risk that's ridiculous, but at the same time, too, this fear certainly holds people back from doing things that God would want them to do. And of course, unsaved people, I mean, it goes even further. It's been said that we aren't prepared to live until we are prepared to die. Because when we're prepared to die, we don't have to, pre- we don't have to fear death. At least not to the extent that we would. Because unpre- being unprepared to die causes great fear. <laughs> And you can understand why. So why is death so fearful? Well, there's several reasons. Number one, it's final. Right? It's final. Once you pass that door, there's no going back. You know, it's not like a revolving door. You walk in and you can just follow it through and come back out. Let's see what's inside and go back out. No, it doesn't work that way, does it? Once you pass through that door, that's it. Death is an undefeated human foe. There has been nobody in their own strength who has wrestled themselves up from the grave. Nobody who has beaten death back, if you will. Once death takes you on, that's it. It is over. Psalm 89, verse 48, What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? It's a rhetorical question. No. No. None of us can. Once we pass through that door, that is it. And everything that has taken place in this life is over, at least for that person, once they pass through. Number two, I think it's easy to see this. It's a very sad and sobering subject, isn't it? Very sad and sobering subject. Very emotionally difficult to consider life without a certain person or people. I mean, it's a very sad thing. It it weighs on people. Yesterday I I, I met up with a man who had lost his wife last fall. Been with her 60-some years. I mean, he still had a lot of joy in his life, but, you know, I know how that weighs on him. I could see that. You know, it's a very sad and sobering subject. And especially when you consider losing somebody that's near and dear to you. I mean, who likes to think about that? Number three, <clears throat> I would say it's the great equalizer of human life. It's the great equalizer. And what I mean by it is this, that death is an absolute respecter of no person's. No, it's no respecter of persons whatsoever. It doesn't matter how rich they are, how poor they are. It doesn't matter what race they are. It doesn't matter where they're from or what they've done or what they've accomplished, what they haven't. It doesn't matter if they're an up and uppity up or a down and outer. Death is equal to everybody. It takes everybody, doesn't it? It's a great equalizer. The wealthiest and most powerful people will all die one day and have over the centuries. And the most destitute of them all will die eventually. Everyone ends up in the same spot, if you will, death. It's the great equalizer. Death treats everyone equally because nobody escapes it. People may dominate over other people on the earth, but death dominates over all. Number four... It reminds us, too, that life is short. James 4.14 says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. See, our trip between the womb and the grave is quite short in comparison to the time that we will spend on the other side of death's door. Hence, it should be appreciated, right? It should be appreciated. But how much do we bellyache about it? How much are we bellyaching about, (laughs) well, my life, uh, yeah, fill in the blank, right? Hey, it's short. You know, when people come to the end, they they, they sit there and they they wonder, why did I I spend so much time being bitter at so-and-so? Why did I spend so much time fretting over this? Why did I spend so much time uh, uh, being in in a position uh, of... uh, 
uh, of uh, complaining and, and not appreciating things. Boy, you know what? You begin to have a lot of regrets at that time. And I've heard some of that uh, in my time as a pastor and people in those types of positions. The regret they have. Because they realize they wasted so much time on nonsense and didn't appreciate the time that they had. And can't get back. Can't get back. How do you feel about your life right now? Hey, one day it's going to be gone. It's a vapor. May it make us be more appreciative of anything. Number five, life is fragile. Life is fragile, isn't it? Our lives are always at the doorstep of death. You realize that? That's hard to, it, it, we don't think of that because we've already got plans years down the road. I mean, I do. I'm sure you do as well. And that's a prudent thing to do, but the reality is we're always at the doorstep of death. <laughs> There's all, we're always one heartbeat, one breath away at all times, regardless of who we are, from the youngest here to the oldest. And things happen to people unexpectedly. They never expected that day, never would have imagined. I was reading this article uh, today when I was studying for this, and it, was, it talked about a student that went down to, he was studying, and decided he needed to get a pop or something from the vending machine. Well, he put his change in and he starts, well, it didn't kick out the soda, so he starts shaking the machine like this. Well, he shook it so much that the machine fell back on him and crushed him to death. Could you imagine? No, he just went down stairs. He wasn't thinking he was going to die, but he did. Life's fragile. Life's fragile. Lives have been snuffed out earlier than expected in some cases. Again, that's why we need to appreciate what we have. Instead of bellyaching about what we don't have. Number six, it's the great unknown. In other words, for many people, the unknown of what the experience is like and what happens on the other side is very frightening to the point they don't even want to think about it until they're forced to. I think when people are most forced to think about it is when they attend a funeral. When they attend a funeral. Boy, things get humble and things get sober. I know we, there, sometimes at funerals there'll be some laughing about some memories, but you know what? The reality of that thing does hit home during the service. I, I've done enough of them over the years to, to see that. It, it uh, puts reality right back into its proper perspective when you, when you experience the, that kind of stuff. Now I've heard people say, well I'm very confident about what's going to happen to me, but inwardly I know they're very, this is a very unnerving subject because that fear of death is real. The Bible mentions that that is something that, is, that, that uh, plagues people. And these are some of the reasons why. Because it's, it's a serious subject. With serious long term, and that's a weird way, of, it's, it's not as deep as, a, as I would like to, to communicate, but it has long term consequences that go on forever. There's the fear of it. Secondly, we see what I call the folly. Now, considering all that I have addressed and the certainty of death, logic would state that people would be or should be doing everything they need to, in order to prepare for their looming departure. You know, logically speaking, when you think about all those things, yeah, I mean, that is, tr that is a guarantee and all those things, yeah, they're real. And you would think that people would sit there and think, you know what, I've got to prepare for this. I've got to get ready for this. I mean, this is, this is a big deal. But in all reality, very few people really consider seeking answers about their eternal questions. 
don't they? Not, not, not as many as you would think. You know, people will plan for everything else. I've, I've met people who have master plans for their careers, master plans for their retirements, master plans to disperse their wealth after they die. All well and fine. But when it comes to being ready for what's to come on the other side or just trying to figure out what happens on the other side, not so much thought has been given to that. How do you know? We'll ask a person a question like this. Are you 100% sure you know what happens when you die? And you'll get some real funny answers sometimes. Even some squirmish looks. I remember the first time that was asked to me. I, I tell you, it hit me like, like a ton of bricks on my heart because I'd never thought about that before until somebody asked me that. I was thinking about religious things, but not to that extent. You get a lot of answers that, that somewhat are communicated like this. Well, I hope so. I think so. But it's, but it's kind of, in many cases, it's a little shaky. Now, you'll get occasionally one, oh, yeah, I know so. And I'll say, well, how do you know that? Well, I'm a choir member. I go to church, and I do this, and I do that. You know, they, they'll give you the resume that's about a mile long. And, but, you know, it's nothing to do with salvation at all. It's just all these things that they've done. So they figure that they're a shoo-in. Well, according to Matthew chapter 7, there are going to be people like that, and Jesus said, but they're going to get the shock of their life when they show up on eternity's shores. But there are a lot of people, if you ask them directly, if you died right now, do you know, if, do you know where you go or do you know what would happen? And, and they don't know that for sure. They'll try to give you some kind of side hope, but there, there is that element of doubt and that can be sensed as you talk. I had that. I answered that question like that too. And of course, the guy who witnessed to me knew how to answer me. You know, God says in his word that people can know before they die they're going to heaven. 1 John 5.13, These things that I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. I remember when I heard that the first time too, I was like, I never knew that was in the Bible. I just thought you went across the other side and you found out. What a horrible way to live, by the way. And when I saw that, I could know. I'm like, well, I'd like to know how I can know. And, you know, long story short, it led me to salvation over the course of time. But God wants people to know that. People can know before they die where they're going. And they need to know because too much is at stake. There's way too much at stake. But sadly, I find people overly procrastinate over the single most guaranteed thing in life, their own death. People are the worst procrastinators over the most important subject. Which is the most illogical thing to do, but they do. It's the greatest folly. So why do they do that? Well, number one, I think this may be a huge one, ignorance. Many people simply don't know or question if they can know the certainty of what happens when they pass through death's doors. A lot of it has to do to what they've been too exposed to, religiously speaking. Okay? They may have been given a lot of bad information like I was about it. I believe many people assume unless you are really, really, really bad, by human standards, but that is, unless you're really, really, really bad, you'll go to heaven. So most go there, right? 
Many people believe that they have done far more good than bad and are ignorant of basic Bible statements about their condition in comparison to God. Where the Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none good, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. James 2.10 says we can keep the whole law to fed it in one point, yet we're guilty of all. <laughs> that the only way you can be good enough to get to heaven is that you've got to be God. Because he's the only one that is good. Right? Our verses like Ephesians 2, 8, 9 we're well familiar with. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast. In other words, there's the ignorance of just what the Bible has to say about it. Or even greater ignorance in response in respect to what is truth. Sadly, many never want to dare question what they believe. Few do. Or begin looking in the scriptures, or they just say, Well, I believe my minister, whatever he goes by. And it's like ignorance is bliss. It's not. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to this matter. And it's worth the time for somebody to seek out real answers and be settled on that instead of just taking the cheap insurance policy that so much religion offers. Because if you get this wrong, you can't go and do a re redo. You can't go back and demand your money back. You can't go back and complain to the one who sold you the... The, the bad bill of goods. Because once you go through, that's it. There's no going back. And you need to be very sure that what you believe is true. Because if it is not true, you're out of luck. And there's a lot of deception out there. And I believe if you truly want the truth, the truth will hit you right in the face. It's a matter of you just accepting it. Sadly, many don't even want to go there. Nah, I'm fine. It'll all work out somehow. <laughs> yeah, they don't, think that, they don't take that approach to their careers, retirement, wills, and whatever else. But your eternity? Really? I believe many people sit in that ignorant position. Even to the point where some, like I said, have gotten bad information. I've I've even heard things on the lines of they think hell is more or less just a party. And, well, if I don't make heaven, you know, hell is just going to be one of those kind of wild type parties. Well, uh, no, it's not that way. Not even remotely close. Ignorance. Number two, too busy living life. I believe many people also think that they'll deal with eternal stuff when they have a more convenient season of life. That was Felix, I believe, in, Rome, or in Acts 24, 25, when Paul was witnessing to him and speaking to him about these eternal things, about his soul. It mentions here, and he's, as he, Paul, the apostle, reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. In other words, the afterlife. Felix trembled. In other words, he got concerned about his soul. It struck a chord in his heart and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. In other words, yeah, I know I need to deal with this, but not now. I've got too much life to live. I've got too much going on. I, I'm busy. I mean, I've got places to go, people to see, parties to attend. And that was Felix's mentality. And as far as we know, that convenient season for Felix never showed up. Usually, the convenience season doesn't show up. They don't get around to it. How many things do you have on your bucket list or your things to do that you just somehow just don't get around to? And this one just conveniently happens that way. Just don't get around to it. Or death seizes them before they 
before they realized, or, or, or before they expected it. I didn't expect it this soon. Remember in, in Luke 12, the, that rich man that built the, his barns, says he's got all this bumper crop, he's like, I'm going to tear down my barns, build bigger, and take ease, drink, and be merry, and so forth. And, and God tells the man in, in, the, in, the, in the story, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, right? Before he knew it, well before he expected it, he went through that door. Again, usually they simply don't get around to it or death seizes them before they can. Hey, look, if God is speaking to our hearts about the need of it, to address it, then we need to deal with it when God's speaking. Because guess what? He may not speak again. He may not speak again. Number three, people are enjoying sin too much. Because the idea of getting religious, I'll just put it that way, that's how they would describe it, would go against the way they want to live their life. Say, well, if I get like that, if I take my soul seriously, you know, I, I don't want to change course in my life. I mean, I'm just having too much fun in whatever sin it is that they're enjoying. But the pleasures of sin blind them from the reality of their eternity. Because salvation requires one to deal with their sins in order to be prepared for eternity, right? Which, of course, isn't what is wanted to be done. They don't want to do that. Jesus mentioned this in John 3.19, and this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. In other words, they enjoyed sin so much that they said, oh, forget the other world. I'm too busy about having now. I'm having too much fun now. I'll think about it later, maybe. Or, you know, right now, if I get too religious, I'm going to be considered weird and out of step and not in vogue and not with the crowd. And, and I'm having too much fun with that. Well, guess what? None of the drinking buddies, none of the gospel girls are going to be with you and standing next to you on Judgment Day. You stand before God on that day and Him alone for what you've done. Hey, light is coming to the world. Don't allow darkness, a love for darkness, to squelch out that light. But people do. That's a big folly. Number four, it's uncomfortable. Of course, the idea of death is uncomfortable. It's fearful. Sometimes so much so, people just want to ignore it. They just kind of want to go walk around and go, la, 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 la. You know? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about positive, happy things. Well, there are positive, happy things in the Word of God. But they can't be positive and happy for you if you're not prepared for eternity. Uncomfortable. The idea is fearful. Sometimes they just don't. Want, they just don't want to deal with it. They want to ignore it. But as with everything else, that's folly. You can't just wish something away because you don't want it. You can't say oh, if I ignore it, it'll just go away. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. Not with the only guarantee in life. These reasons contribute to Jesus' statement on, of why so many go through the door of eternity unprepared and shocked by what they experience afterwards. I wasn't expecting this. is because one of these reasons and maybe many others, you didn't take it seriously. You didn't think about it. You didn't, you, you didn't get prepared. You didn't seek out how you could be prepared. I can appreciate a seeker because they're trying to figure out what the truth is. And I believe if they sincerely want the truth, they'll find it. Some say they do, kiss the door, and walk away, kind of like Judas did. But if you truly want the truth, God will get it across your path. And then it'll be up to you to choose it or not. That's where I was 20-some years ago. And it was a heavy choice, but I never regretted the day that I did it. <laughs> Heaven since. And when I speak of that, I mean the day I got saved. 
because I knew that I needed to be prepared. As we talk about thirdly and finally, the facts. The great news is that for us, though, about death is that it actually has been conquered. It's been conquered. Back in our text in verse 14 in chapter 2 of Hebrews, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, this is again speaking of Jesus, likewise took part of the same. In other words, he became a human being, flesh and blood, if you will, that through death, through his death on the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. When Christ rose from the grave, when he resurrected, he delivered a death blow to death, if you will. That was one of the big reasons why, if you study the book of Acts, you see the word, you see that they were preaching Christ and the resurrection. That was a big thing. To know that there is something beyond death, something that was more promising than the life now, if I can put it this way, that's a good selling point. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, wow, I mean, God's got something better for me if I turn to him? In fact, he, he's willing to forgive me of everything I've ever done. Well, I mean, that's a great deal. It really is. That's why it was such a good, wonderful selling point in a world that was filled at that time with idolatry. And the only hope of happiness was some kind of pleasurable sin that left one just empty anyways. I like how it says it here in 2 Timothy 1.10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In other words, God is offering through salvation immortality. Immortality and life, eternal life with him. He made it possible for us to live on beyond the grave with him in heaven and, of course, avoid that second death. That we don't have to die ignorant, but fully prepared to enter the door of eternity without so much fear. Without so much what happens. Without so much concern. See, the day we get saved, God promises to bring us to heaven when we die and instructs us how to live in light of what's in store, eternally speaking, too, doesn't he? In fact, to God, the death of his saints... That's what a saved person is called, of course. A saint. Death is actually a precious reunion time. Particularly between him and his own. Psalm 116, 150, verse 15. Precious is the sight of the Lord, is the death of his saints. Wow. You know, I've been to a, enough funerals in my life now, and I've preached, um, I'm not sure how many, but several. I've done funerals of saved people. I've done funerals of unsaved people, at least from what I understand. I've been to funerals of, uns, of, of saved people that I, hadn't, I didn't officiate or anything like that, and, and I've always noticed whether I'm doing it or they're, you know, there, there's, there's a, a real element of hope. And yeah, it's sad, but it's not so bad. Because based on what we know of the scriptures, we know they're up with God. And, we're, and the minister doesn't have to sit there and somehow help that person get there by what they say. No, we know it based on their salvation testimony and what God has promised to do for those that, go, that get saved. But I've been to those... That have been that of people that are unsaved and just the you know there's a lot of it, it, it's kind of morbid a little bit. It's really sad. The hopelessness that you see amongst the people, yeah, they they think that they're in heaven. The minister may even say that they're in heaven, but you know what? There's just not that much assurance. Of course, nobody wants to think of the other thing, but. But you know what? There's just not a confidence there that it weighs down on, 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 on those that are in attendance. And it's so sad. I'm thankful. I, I've enjoyed, as much as you can enjoy a funeral, I guess, being able to preach and, and do officiate those funerals of saved people because 
you can give that confidence and you can give that assurance. In fact, some a few years back, I, I was able to do a funeral service, more or less a memorial service, for a little baby that had died. The mother didn't know a whole lot about the scriptures, as far as I know. But to communicate what the Bible says about a baby going to heaven, you know, not, you know, not, not even if they weren't baptized and all that kind of stuff. And that, and that mother, after the service, came up and gave me a big hug and just was just in tears and was just so grateful for that. To know those truths is very liberating, isn't it? To know what the Bible says and have confidence about that sure takes a burden off, even in those very, very delicate times. But in other cases, it's not. And it's sad because there's just so much unknown. The day is coming, though, as well, that God will once and for all eradicate death from the creation. And that's going to be a really wonderful day. If you go back to Revelation chapter 20, it says here in Revelation 20, verse 14, of course, we read this earlier, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, God gets rid of death. He, he, he casts it aside. It will no longer exist. Verse chapter 21 of Revelation and verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Death will be gone because sin will be eradicated from the creation, the sting of death will no longer exist. It will cease to be experienced. And that will be nice not to have to think about that separation process ever again. But until that time, people will still go through that door to eternity. The question is, first off, are you prepared for it? Second off, if you are prepared for it, how many people have you been helping to get prepared for it? Because there's a lot of ignorance out there. Because the day is coming for all of us. And it's a folly not to be prepared. It's foolishness. But God has a means in which we all can be. Hopefully we've taken that up by God's grace. Let's stand to our feet tonight. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're going to spend a few moments tonight just in a word of invitation. I understand it's a very